Well, good morning to you. We really appreciate you creating time for us. A news check begins right now. Be hopeful. It's a beautiful day. Thank you so much for choosing KBC Channel 1 as we kick start the day's coverage of news and reviews right here on our national broadcast. We want to take you through some of the events that are happening in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, and also have a studio conversation on the issues that are shaping the agenda for the country as you assess the state of the nation. Uh, today we are having this interview just a few hours after the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission gave uh, the BBI initiative a green light to go to the counties out of the 4 million signatures submitted by the task force. IEBC yesterday confirmed that they have approved uh, ab about 1.1 million signatures uh, that were submitted by registered voters. We'll be having that conversation and what lies ahead for the BBI journey and of course also talking about other matters that are waiting in the country, COVID-19, the insecurity issues that are currently being reported outside the northeastern region. The other day it was Capedo and what needs to be done to find a lasting solution to the perennial insecurity issues in some of these regions. And uh, joining me to have that conversation, I will be engaging Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar, a humanitarian by heart. He's the member of parliament uh, for Wajia South. He sits at the Finance and Health Committee at the National Assembly and is also a professor of tropical and infectious diseases. Thank you so much for creating time for pleasure, us. Pleasure, Serene. Pleasure. Yes. It's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Happy yes. New Year. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> it's been a it's while. Been, it is. A lot has happened. Indeed. And, and we want to track that yes. and talk about, yes. uh, you know, what, what yes. lies ahead for the country. Well, I mean, uh, there is hope. I mean, I'm always, uh, uh, you know, an optimistic man and uh, there is always hope and, uh, you know, behind the tunnel and therefore uh, there is a brighter future for Kenya. That's mm -hmm. the way I see, uh, for multiple reasons, which I'm going to explain eventually. Uh, but um, I would say hope. All right, there is hope. And I began by telling you, be hopeful. Yes. It's a beautiful day. Of course, we want you to be part of this particular conversation. And uh, we, you can do that via our social media platforms at KBC Channel 1. And also you can talk to me directly at Safin underscore Cheng on Twitter, Safin Cheng on Facebook. Share with us your thoughts on some of the issues we are going to be raising in this very important conversation. And we will share that to add value in the debate that is going on in the country. Now, uh, we, we just want to start from the political side <laughs> and look at um, BBI. Yesterday, uh, like I said, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission mm. gave it a nod. Um, uh, over one million signatures have been approved. That meets the <coughs> constitutional threshold to take it to the next level. Um, your quick thoughts on, on this, considering the fact that the task force submitted four million signatures a hooping three million were disregarded. Does it send any message from where you sit? Well, I mean, uh, look, uh, they are always technical. Although I don't have the details of what the, uh, what the challenges the IABC faced, uh, there is always an issue that, that happens when it comes into collecting signatures from uh, so many categories of people. Uh, there are those that never went to school, there are those ones that went to school but uh, uh, did not uh, append their signatures correctly or, or, or something of the sort. I would speculate that. Uh, but obviously, obviously, uh, it would have been very important, at least if we would have had 50% of the 4 million yeah. uh, signatures, you know, uh, approved. approved. Uh, but however, uh, I don't know the reasons behind why those challenges were there and what they are, because I haven't seen uh, the actual report back. Uh, but what I can say is that 1.1 million puts it to the threshold that is required legally. Uh, and uh, uh, so that the next level can go on to uh, and uh, the uh, provision on the Constitution, uh, Article 257.4, I think it is, uh, uh, that requires uh, to, to, to go to the next level that is going to the, national, uh, the mm. county assemblies mm -hmm. and then from there on going to the National Assembly and uh, as well as the Senate. And that is where it will head to. Uh, but 1.1 put it to the threshold required mm -hmm. in the legal sense. Mm -hmm. But still, um, those who are reading detail into this, actually, um, you know, would, would question the, the level of confidence the proponents of the BBI initiative had when they were collecting these signatures. Four million actually spoke very loudly, if you ask me. But right now, only having one million, does it dim the light or fade the momentum? Look, um, you know, it depends on which side of, of the fence one is sitting. Uh, and uh, that side means that uh, there are those people who will argue that uh, 4 million uh, and then you get 1.1 million 
that is quite disparity. Uh, that, that is there. And, and obviously, nobody can shed off, even myself. I see it that it would have been better to see at least two million. However, uh, have we met the constitutional uh, you know, requirements for a process to occur, uh, for a conversation to continue? I would say yes. So long as the, we are within the constitutional provision, uh, there will be always naysayers. Uh, uh, and I'm not here to defend uh, necess uh, unnecessarily, but I'm only saying from the side of the, 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 the legislative and uh, the constitutional uh, provision, I think uh, we've got the threshold that was required. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right. You've also talked to us about the, what lies ahead. It will be taken to uh, the counties, and county assemblies are now expected to be debating uh, the Constitutional Amendment Bill of 2020 within three months. Um, what are the chances of it sailing through? I believe it should be at least 24 counties. At the minimum average that is required is 24 counties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think uh, while, while uh, the pundits will say what they think, uh, in many fronts, uh, I think it will face challenges. However, uh, it will eventually sail through because though there are 24 counties that are uh, quite, quite, uh, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing that it sails through. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot tell you about my county simply because of multiple factors. And these factors are that, uh, things that have not been explored further onto it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, but the reality, the reality is that uh, 24 counties uh, will give the nod and and that is where the next level will begin from the minimum from at least you, minimum. you have yes. that what gives you that confidence well i mean uh, look we've been examining uh, the, uh, the the current social media discussions we've been looking at how kenyans are speaking on the forums and and and, and you know and, and podiums what we have realized is that uh, many of the kenyans are realizing that uh, uh, there is a process that needs to take place and this process has already been sold uh, while i would have like to see that it is being sold much better. Uh, there has uh, there has been considerable amount of efforts that's been put in by the two principals to ensure that uh, uh, this is looked at from an angle of uh, what the president wants and the, and, the, and his his his, uh, his counterpart in, in 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 the other party mm -hmm. uh, to to see that uh, uh, you know uh, the the discussions and the handshake is delivered accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I would like to see that uh, many, much more is done. Uh, there has been no much publicity and selling of this uh, to see that uh, we have gone, you know, by far uh, more than the uh, threshold that is uh, the 24 counties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at um, the key highlights are contained in this constitutional amendment bill, mm -hmm. the draft, mm -hmm. um, what is it that you term as some of the points that would be sellable across the counties, something that would entice the counties to support this bill? Well, you see, uh, the, 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 the thing that will be selling to some of the counties is some of the people have already said what they want out of it. And uh, to some extent, uh, let me give you the two angles. The two angles that are being argued about are the counties that are getting more revenues and there are counties that are not going to be getting more revenues. There are actually counties that are going to lose revenues. And definitely those counties that are going to lose revenues will definitely be taking a tag. And that tag is to say that we've already lost. Uh, some constituencies will be missing out, like mm -hmm. Wajir South constituency, Ijara. These are the constituencies that are going to miss out. Are you part of Obviously, the losing? I am, I am part list. of the losing. Wajir South is not going to get a constituency. Mm -hmm. Ijara is not going to get a constituency that is in Northeastern. And by fact that we have got nearly 300,000 population, for both constituencies that I'm talking about, we're still missing out. So I will not shy away saying that I, myself, is at loss on that particular perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the, the question that you asked takes me back to why should some other counties be accepting? And these other counties are going to be accepting simply because they're getting more revenues, they're getting more constituencies, they're getting more uh, you know, uh, value onto that. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the general aspect of it, uh, the provision that, uh, you know, uh, constitutional amendment is required on is, is something that we have to grow from one position to another. And, and therefore, this is a country that is on development transition. And for it to happen to that, uh, then there has to be conversation always on the ground. I will leave to my people to make the conversation and the decisions mm -hmm. for that particular matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I have said mine time and again on television saying that 
uh, Wajir South is equivalent to Central Province, Nairobi Province, and Western Provinces combined. Uh, that is a large mass. So it is, it is, it is about 64 constituencies combined, mm -hmm. and therefore we are losing, obviously. So uh, if my constituency can, you know, 64 constituencies can fit into my constituency, that single constituency, mm -hmm. then getting an extra would have been a great thing for us. And therefore, we have put our advocacy forward. We have said it all. Uh, but should the country stop for that pass only? Uh, should I hold back for the, the country for that? I would say that I will continue to insist that we get uh, extra constituencies. Ijara and Wajir South uh, needs to be considered onto that. That is the point that you have raised mm -hmm. with me saying that including the constituencies, whether we are the ones to miss. Yes, we are. All right. Revenues, yes, we are missing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is very important that the core principles, uh, you know, do understand that obviously there is a loss that is to being some, felt to, in, some in, areas. to some areas. So that can actually pose a very big challenge, um, you know, during this journey I across the, the counties for the, I, 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 I for the bill. My, I, I want my constituents to converse about and, it. Uh, about it and but, discuss. But, but, but still, let me take you back. Uh, yeah. uh, when I was having um, a conversation with you, was it when the BBI uh, report was being unveiled in Kisi, you spoke very highly about the report and even said Wajia South is the home of the BI. True. Has that and, changed? And, and, and look, Bearing uh, in mind that well, you're well, citing well, some it grievances hasn't changed. this morning. It hasn't changed to some extent because we are pro-government and we will be supporting President Uhuru Kenyatta okay. uh, to the last man standing for us. That is definitely there. And we have got multiple reasons for that. There are places that we've missed out on and there are other progresses that are happening in my constituency that the government is trying mm -hmm. to support. Mm -hmm. Uh, albeit, albeit, I would have liked to see at least an inch of a tarmac before the president leaves, and I would have seen the last mile reaching my constituency. These are two critical matters, including representation being taken care of. And therefore, I will not shy away saying, this is the noise coming from my community. I will not shy away saying that we need to be considered and looked at. Uh, but that does not mean that uh, our support for the president, for his legacy, is you know, looked on the left side. What no, about your support, support for the BBI process? You well, I mean, the support for the BBI process. What about the BBI process? No doubt, no doubt. Uh, the president's agenda is part of the BBI, and therefore that is where we say it wholesomely that we have to support the president in this matter. Mm -hmm. All right, because so the BBI I know comes with because it. Because I know further discussions are still going on, and he's hearing. Uh, he knows that we just south will eventually be split. So the hope is there. I mean, I'm a very, you know, optimistic person, I've always said, and throughout my life, and the progresses that I've always made in life, was that I was always hopeful. hopeful. And I know it is on the table of the president for this consideration, as I speak to you. That's why I'm speaking in confidence, that my support to the president's agenda will always be there. And I know that uh, the discussions that we have put forward, uh, the requests that we've put forward, that Ijara and Wajir South are considered, still remains open for us. And therefore, no door has been shut yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, it's, it's still a matter of wait and see uh, whether that will, will, will be uh, considered. But let's open up this document a little bit and, and look at, uh, is there anything you find useful uh, that would change the narrative for the people, for example, from your constituency or even the northeastern region? If you look at the BBI document, aside from the grievances you've raised, is there anything that, uh, you know, is, 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 is bringing a beautiful promise for that region? Well, look, uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple factors uh, need to be examined onto that. Constitutional, uh, constitutional uh, review is something that needs to be looked from a wholesome point of view. So I'll leave it as a wholesome point that uh, definitely it has its plus and minuses. Uh, but do we weigh it off uh, the, 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 uh, the negative or the alternative for that matter. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, that is uh, not, not at this particular stage uh, in consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you're a strong advocate for a negotiated democracy sort of a setup. If you look at uh, the BBI journey and uh, the promise it carries to herald Kenya into a new direction, um, does it incorporate that idea? Negotiated democracy is one of the uh, things that I came by and definitely uh, our elders have uh, decided to sit under a tree and say uh, we will need to give and take and we will, give an, uh, we will need to give and take in the sense that we will be working out or who represents us 
Now, if I can shift that to the current political discussions as well as the current conversation within the country uh, that is about the building bridges, that also resonates towards the negotiated democracy in this case. And this is where we were seeing from an angle, saying that let the people's representative discuss BBI. Let the people's representative communicate to the people. Let the, that be sold quite clearly by them. And therefore, that is the kind of uh, democracy. Look, Kenya is a homogeneous country. Mm -hmm. Negotiated democracy may not necessarily be looked at other counties mm -hmm. or constituencies. It might be rife and important and has delivered uh, in particular parts of the country, which is like the northern region. Unlike places, say, Nyanza, mm -hmm. which doesn't, that doesn't exist there. It is about, you know, uh, a democracy through the ballot only. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and for us, obviously, democracy through the ballot still exists. But there is pre-democracy prior to the ballot that really exists. Is it? And, mm -hmm. I want to understand whether that is genuine democracy. If you're not giving me a chance to directly have the decision and have a say on who I want to be my representative in terms of a leader, that a few people sit and agree that we are giving this person um, the green light to represent this community, and then the rest of the community is left I'll out bring, of that I'll, decision. I'll bring yeah? it back to you. Yeah, just explain. Before, for me. before, before an ODM member of parliament is elected, he or she will go to the party, negotiate for they, negotiate for they for the ticket mm -hmm. to be able to contest against any other party within that constituency. Now, that pre election is that not a process that's a process fine but now here it comes what happens with negotiated democracy was like the way it was done to us was that there was a ballot that was put there so it was done through ballot so each member it is like the 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 u.s um the united states um uh um you know uh, what do they call it the electoral electoral college mm -hmm. it's like the electoral college so here these are about 50 elders sitting somewhere. They represent particular communities, say particular villages and the likes. And they say, we want to contest against village C. And this is A and B. So A and B sit together. And they say, we want to contest against C. And therefore their electoral college are the elders who are representing particular villages and subclans. And therefore they come up with saying that we put a ballot box there. Exactly that was done. And this, this is already on, you know, on the internet, and you can find it out. Mm -hmm. So the ballot was done there. And therefore, it is the same as getting a ticket, an ODM ticket, in a particular constituency, so that you can contest against a jubilee candidate. You know, candidate. Mm -hmm. And the same thing. So it is, the only difference is that one is formally done, and the other one is done at the local level. And that is, that is the only difference, and it can be taken it that way. If the United States can have electoral college and decide who gets the ticket for Democrats or the Republicans, then it means it is the same thing that is happening under a tree, but it is albeit being done by, you know, uh, elders that have not been through formal education. They are educated elders. They are educated with the Quran. They are educated with other religious matters. So these are also educated men and All women. Right. Can that work in the national leadership context? Well, a negotiated uh, democracy to agree. Well, let's, has, let's endorse this. Person. Well, has it worked for the Democrats? to be able to have a negotiation within the party to get that. Has it worked for ODM, uh, you know, a ticket holder uh, from the village in Ugenya, for example, uh, to decide and say, we are deciding on this candidate for our ODM flag bearer? Uh, that is exactly what it is. So saying that with your South flag bearer, Clan A wants to have this, mm -hmm. you know? So societies establish their own democratic rules and regulations, and that is quite important. Uh, to be respected and therefore they have already done that for many many years in fact it is important to borrow a leaf from there mm -hmm. and understand much better than uh, you know categorize it out so, right. so as, as, as we walk towards the journey of inclusion the reason I asked you that question is because BBI actually one of the promises it carries is that it's going to really focus on 
achieving rep uh, full representation and inclusion in positions of leadership in the country and even highlighting uh, strategies on how that can, can go. As we walk that journey uh, from where you sit, what do you think um, is the best way, the best approach that will actually um, help the country um, fully embrace that representation, that other communities will not feel left out uh, of the leadership positions that we have? What is it that we need to do to get it right? You see, I'll take you back a bit. So much, so much can be taken uh, for representation. If you say everybody will represent everybody, it becomes a challenge. So why am I saying that? We have got six categories of electorates or el post, election, uh, electoral posts. Uh, and that is from the MCA to the president. So these are six posts. Now these six posts are representing particular areas within the country. Mm -hmm. And that is the lowest from MCA representing a particular you know, uh, area. And, and it goes through that way. So if you are going to tell me that we need to represent in the election, everybody, then that is a huge, huge burden on, on, on the taxpayers. So what's your take but then on, on the proposal to expand the executive yeah, I'm, I'm, to achieve I'm, I'm, inclusion? I'm coming, I'm coming to that. All right. The levels that are going to be increased is at the national level. Now, there will be no changes that's going to happen to the county assembly. True? There will be no changes to the governor. There will be no changes to the member of parliament except the increase. Of course, let me put away the member of parliament, Senate. There will be no increase on that. And therefore... There's a woman and a man. Yes, the a woman and a man. But that increase is, is in that means... Uh, because two-third majority of the gender uh, could not be realized in the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for over 10 years. And the debate continued uh, to actually even make uh, the, the current parliament illegal. You know, in place, and therefore that really needs to be addressed through that means. I mean, simply because our communities have not gone to the level, to the Kenyan communities, have, or even the African society have not gone to the level where, at the equal level, female are also elected mm. to their male counterparts, and therefore that challenge is still there. But will this address? Will BBI address? Mm -hmm. No, it has only started the journey to address that. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you right now, and anybody can you know argue about it. It is only a journey that has begun. It will not be a resolution or it will not resolve all matters at one go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where I think. All right. So those who believe, those who are hopeful that this is actually it, this is the it for us, this is what is going to fix all the issues we are facing as a country, what you're saying is it's just a start of the journey, not the entire solution, yes. if I get you correctly. That's true. All right. Mm. Allow us to take a very short break. Uh, this is uh, actually a news check. We are talking about the state of the nation. I'm having uh, Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar, the Member of Parliament for Wajir South. We'll be coming back after the conversation to pick it up and talk about more issues. Stay with us. We are coming back. And thank you so much for staying with us. This is News Check, in case you're just joining us. A program that seeks to explore issues that are shaping the news today. We are assessing the state of the nation, talking about matters BBI. Later, we will pick it up and talk about COVID-19 situation and also the insecurity situation in some parts of the country, finding and discussing about what ought to be the, uh, the lasting solution to some of these issues. Now, uh, I've been having this conversation together with Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar, the Member of Parliament for 
for Wajia Sal. Thank you so much for staying on. Pleasure. Yes, and we were just talking about uh, the BBI um, initiative that yesterday the IEBC gave a nod after uh, the commission approved uh, signatures of 1.14 million registered voters who support the constitutional amendment bill of uh, 2020. We are talking about the way forward and what lies ahead in this journey to change the uh, 2010 uh, constitution. And before we took the break, Mushmiwa, you were, you were sort of explaining to us what representation ought to mean and how we can achieve that representation um, in an effective way as a country. I just want you to pick up from that uh, you know, subject and talk to us about um, you, even this, um, pro, pro, uh, I would say it is a, a, a promise that has been delivered by the BBI that you know, it will sort of fix the winner takes it all electoral you know uh, challenges that come with the uh, winner takes it all electoral formula do you believe that if we go that direction probably we can actually have all the communities including those who have felt marginalized for centuries um you know feel like for once we are part of the leadership of this country we can make decisions at the table you see if i look at from my own point of view in terms of what i feel about representation at the executive level whether that is sufficient enough to say those people who are underrepresented are represented. What we are talking about is prime ministerial position. We are talking about deputy presidents. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, deputy prime ministers. Uh, we have got 42 or 43 for that matter, inc including the Makonde, uh, uh, you know, um, communities mm -hmm. uh, in Kenya. And will, will everybody fit into that, uh, you know, those four or five categories that were included? Mm -hmm. Anything else of a change? I don't see whether there's much change in terms of, of, of the previous aspect on it. So you're but saying that, the, the inclusion at the national, at the executive level is not enough? Well, that's not enough. Yeah. There, there, there are many other things that really need to be looked at. So, so those ones who are, uh, you know, shouting to the rooftop saying that uh, uh, representation will be sufficient in that perspective, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, giving deputy presidents and giving vice uh, uh, deputy deputy prime ministers uh, and and the president and the vice uh, and the president and the uh, and the prime ministerial positions would be sufficient to represent every Kenyan who are underrepresented. I mean, can anybody sell that? To be frank with you, can anybody discuss that? What I really need to see is that uh, you know a plain field argument over that is required but I, I will not go there right now what I, I really want to talk about the representation aspect of it is that uh, some people do argue saying that northeastern is sparsely populated or northern region is sparsely populated mm -hmm. and therefore uh, you know uh, we, we we need to consider more of a place that is more populated uh, than, 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 than northern Kenya uh, I mean the argument for me is that I want people to look from economic perspective you see uh, uh, look at the cost-benefit analysis of any aspect, any development that is being done. If you build a hospital uh, in a village, or say a health center in a village, a village A, and village B is about 100 kilometers away, and therefore uh, village B doesn't have a health service, they have to travel 100 kilometers. So the cost of fuel, the cost of travel, the time taken, uh, the, uh, the pain, uh, you know, all these are, you know, uh, uh, all these are costs that are not looked at. And therefore, that health center that you have built far away uh, and a health center that is one kilometer away, uh, obviously, obviously, you have underrepresented those people who are far away, about 100 kilometers difference in, to get service. If you want to go and get a birth certificate for your child, you don't have to travel 290 kilometers the way from Habaswen to Gerile or Habaswen to Dif, or Dadajabula, or the other corner, mm -hmm. or Dardar, which is at the border of Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, that could take you 280, almost, to 290 kilometers. Now, you want to go and get that certificate for five of your children. You need to travel with the mother and father to go and get that. Where is service delivery looked at? So service delivery must be pegged on cost-effective analysis, and cost-benefit analysis, cost-effective, rather. Let me use that one. Uh, as the economic uh, aspects of it. Now, here you have actually, uh, and the roads are rough, the roads are bad, accessibility issues. These are the critical matters and challenges. Understaffing is there. So someone, a ch child who is ill, say in, in somewhere in Thika, 
and wants to come to a medical facility in you know uh, Kenyatta uh, National University uh, Kenyatta University Hospital is how many kilometers just mm -hmm. a few kilometers away so they will take about 10 minutes uh, to drive there mm -hmm. while a child in div coming to Habaswen hospital it will take them about two days to travel mm -hmm. for a health service you know provision uh, giving the terrain and all those stuff all right so 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 under representations is there all right and and we cannot ignore that all right mm -hmm. uh, we, we will come back to that and uh, you you've given the economic justification but you also respond to those who argue that the population justification makes more sense like where there are people then let's give them the resources and the infrastructure that they need. You will respond to that when we come back. I want us now to focus on something that is also happening this morning. Uh, the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Nairobi is currently having uh, a forum. It's an Iran-Kenya business uh, forum and uh, it is happening uh, this particular morning uh, at uh, the... Uh, uh, we, uh, all right, let's just listen into what is happening. Uh, the Iran Vice President is currently speaking. First in the region, the number of university students in Iran increased to more than 4 million, which puts Iran among the top five countries in terms of number of graduate engineers. Iran's ranking in the Global Innovation Index has also increased by 55 places over the past five years. And we have had an increasing growth in the development of advanced technologies such as nanotechnology, biotechnology, renewable energies, cognitive science, stem cell, and ICT. Also, as a result of the implementation of knowledge-based economy development policies in Iran, the size of the knowledge-based economy in Iran has grew to over 11 billion US dollars. Through the activity of 5,000 and 600 knowledge-based companies and more than 1,040 uh, creative and innovative ones. My dear friends, we all know effective global cooperation is now much more important for us because we are investing in technology and innovation to keep sustainable and competitive growth. To this aim, the Islamic Republic of Iran, by relying on its cap capabilities, is trying to develop constructive and dynamic relations and cooperation globally. Hopefully, Kenya is among the priorities of Iran's bilateral cooperation. Undoubtedly, the role of government in each country is to pave the way for basic required platforms for international interactions of the private sector, something which has been done by opening this technology and innovation center and holding more commercial forum like this. I hope today's opening ceremony of the center and following B2B meetings between Iranian and Kenyan enterprises become a turning point in bilateral economic collaboration. The Islamic Republic of Iran fully supports such partnerships between Iranian and Kenyan enterprises. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, your Vice President, Dr. Sorena Satari, for such a remarkable speech. All right, that is Mr. Sorena Satari, the Vice President of Iran, currently speaking at uh, uh, the Kenya-Iran Business Forum happening at the Iran House of Innovation and Technology uh, located at Dennis Preet Road, talking about how uh, these two countries can enhance their business relations. And we will be giving you more details about uh, even what some of the Kenyan business community uh, are actually, you know, the, uh, expecting and what they ought to bring on the table concerning this particular relationship. Now, we have been talking about the Building Bridges Initiative as part of the issues that are shaping the agenda for the country this morning, together with Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar. And uh, before we went to the link, Mushimiwa, we had just started exploring um, sort of the issue of resource allocation. This is a hot button, if you may ask me. Um, there was a time back when there was that heated debate about the one-man-one 
shilling vis-a-vis -vis one man one kilometer uh, you know formula of you know allocating resources to different regions i don't know what your justification would be um for those who believe uh, let's take resources to where we have people who are going to be in need of this particular uh, you know the, the, this investments by the government and all that vis-a-vis -vis populations that uh, areas where there are no there are no they, they do not have many people so how do you justify that let me tell you this each kilometer in my constituency is so important uh, so important in terms of uh, investment it is much more or our acres people talk about acreage in develop in in in, in, in say in, mm -hmm. in in uh in in in, in urban centers mm. so people talk about acres uh, for you to buy a, a house uh, you know an eighth of an acre you look at your the value of your land uh, at that level mm -hmm. uh, for us the value in our land is so important simply because that's our grazing place that is where you know our animals graze mm -hmm. and therefore those kilometers are quite critically important are quite important uh, let me catch you short we are picking up from there in a bit let's just go back and finish up with this uh, the ictcs joe musher is currently speaking at uh, the kenya uh, iran business forum let's listen into what he has to say that uh, kenya is at the heart of uh, africa actually if you look at the map of africa uh, your excellency kenya is right where the heart is and it is where we've been working hard to ensure we are providing uh, access to the rest of africa as uh, my good friend uh, Richard uh, Ngati had talked, we have the continental free trade area. The continental free trade area means we now have access to over 1.3 billion Africans. And so the innovations that we're talking about here will be able to reach not just uh, all of Africa, but we can go to the rest of the world. It is our intention to continue to expand some of the investments that we've been putting into this sector. So within uh, the continent, uh, our presidents came together and formed what is called the Smart Africa Alliance. And the Smart Africa Alliance brings together about uh, right now 36 African countries and our plan is to create a single digital market. Within this single digital market, there is no roaming so you're able to use your mobile phone number in any of the countries. And we plan to expand this to all the African uh, countries. Uh, at the same time, the data services are, um, are standard. So you're not being charged more by going to one country uh, versus another. We've also gone further and introduced the mobile money interoperability. So that if you have got mobile money in Kenya, you can be able to use that in Tanzania or in South Africa, in all the different countries that are part of the CFTA and also um, the single digital market that we are we're working on. Within Kenya, we have a great and uh, innovative, youthful uh, population. As Your Excellency, you've mentioned, innovation comes from some of the problems and challenges that we face. Currently, COVID-19 has been one of the major challenges that the country has faced and we've looked at ways of innovating. So as well as um, the government policies that we put in place to ensure that uh, you know, social distancing, washing hands, wearing masks, all those things are taken into account. We also put in challenges for innovations. And uh, similarly, even here in Kenya, uh, some of our students were able to develop uh, ventilators. Others are working on uh, tracking uh, systems for, for the different uh, people and passengers. And, and these solutions are working very well for us. So we're very happy that as we come together here, we can be able to really grow the innovative um, nature and characters amongst ourselves. When we exchange ideas, when we learn together, then we can actually innovate together and be able to grow. Kenya has innovated in uh, many aspects in terms of technology and primarily because we've uh, put in a lot of investment as government in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education, in terms of security, in terms of ensuring that the laws that we have put in place ensure that uh, both the intellectual property of innovations that are being created are protected and at the same time the ability to market those products, those services is made available and we have a, uh, a legal system that is easy to understand and that can be able to protect uh, the many innovations. 
We have as one of our flagship uh, projects for 2030, the Konza Technopolis, where we've made a lot of progress so far in building the horizontal infrastructure. We have started now on the vertical infrastructure. We've uh, universities coming up, we've got hospitals coming up, uh, we've got schools and many other businesses that are now growing within the Konza Technopolis. So we plan to see how we can expand and we hope that the innovations that will come out of this uh, hub are going to be able to take us forward and really create the jobs that we need for our young people so that we can increase and improve on their livelihoods. So since I was not the chief guest, I will not speak uh, much more than that, but really to welcome you again, Your Excellency, to Kenya and look forward to having more interaction and discussion and really to the Iranian business community, take time to also meet with our business community. As you've heard from their leader, they are very keen to interact and learn from you and also you learn from them. And I believe we can be able to come up with very big and great ideas that we can then commercialize and transform the lives of people not only here in Kenya and Iran, but in the rest of the world. So thank you very much and God bless you all. All right, ICT CS Joe Musheru currently speaking at the Iran Kenya Business Forum, happening at the Iran House of Innovation and Technology, talking about how Kenya has invested heavily on innovation in technology and also what is being done to market and protect some of these innovations. Talking about how the center uh, that uh, that function is currently taking place uh, is expected to really boost innovations in the country and also provide uh, job opportunities for the young population. It's a forum that also seeks to strengthen trade relations between our country and Iran. We will be giving you more details about what is emanating from that uh, sitting as we proceed with this particular broadcast. Now, let's come back to what he, we have been talking about, the state of the nation. Um, Mushimio, before we took the link, we were talking about um, the you know, formula to use uh, in resource allocation. And you said, uh, from where you come from, you value every kilometer. It's critical. This is something you hold dear. So just explain to us what, how you justify how uh, you know, we should go the one, man, one, ki one shilling, one kilometer uh, route. You see, in the uh, urban part of Kenya, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, the uh, developed part of Kenya, I'll put it that way, say, as a simple example, uh, Rift Valley, Central Province. Uh, these, these provinces uh, are the breadbasket of this country in terms of agricultural products. But if you tell me somewhere in Homer Bay, uh, they have got their own way of feeding the Ken or Kenya, and that is through, you know, uh, uh, fishing industry. We feed Kenya with meat. You know, uh, the, the nice sausage that you find in the shelves of the uh, shop, uh, uh, supermarkets and the shoppings. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those, those sausages that uh, you take for your breakfasts in the morning do come from our place. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those kilometers feed those you know, animals where you get the sausage from. And therefore, that is why uh, we are leading in you know, over 85% of the, uh, the, 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 the meat uh, products uh, come from uh, uh, those regions, mm -hmm. you know, the nomadic pastoralist region, which is about 80, uh, you know, 80 percent of Kenya's landmass. And therefore, you're looking at that. I'm not only focusing on Wajia South, particularly in that case, but that 80, kilo, 80 percent of the landmass of Kenya are arid and semi-arid regions. And therefore, they feed the animals there. And those animals feed the country mm -hmm. and that is exactly the example that I've given you that those ones that are producing uh, you know uh, fresh products uh, those ones that are producing fisheries and those ones that are producing meat mm -hmm. and therefore those kilometers are critically as important to us when it comes to population now it is also equally as important I can contest there are very few and handful constituencies equivalent in population to a year south 300,000 is at the minimum in the last census that we had. Mm -hmm. 300,000? 300,000 is my population. Mm -hmm. You know, 298 is 3,000. You know, round it off. Mm -hmm. You know, less 2,000, you know, population. And, and, and actually, uh, we have estimated it to be about 450,000. And that population is underrepresented. And therefore, you want to tell me one kilometer, one shilling is not good enough for those populations. Because people decided to live in particular areas, they decided to leave those number of kilometers to graze their animals. 
if every kilometer we would have had a village, where are we going to graze our, uh, mm -hmm. our animals? Mm -hmm. And where are we going to feed? How are we going to feed Kenya? How are we going to export our meat? How are we going to be giving products to the Kenya Meat Commissions? Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to get your sausage in the morning? And these are, these are critical factors that have not been opened up. Mm -hmm. And therefore, every kilometer for us is quite important for us. And therefore, one kilometer, one shilling is something that you cannot divert from the Kenyans in the north or the Kenyans in the semi and uh, the arid and the semi arid region. Mm -hmm. That is why it is so valuable to that. And therefore, investing on the human head is equally as important. You may have one, th one million population in a particular county, and you may have, you know, 500,000 in another county. Those are all Kenyans, and the Constitution provides that every head, every human being must be equally provided, service, must be, you know, service must be provided equally to them. Right. And they, that is where our argument comes in. All right. Uh, th th this issue of marginalization, it's perennial. It's, it's something that has been there year in, year out. What's the missing link? What is it? Are we really being genuine in, in, in when we say we want to address this issue? In my last conversation what do with you, you read? in my last conversation with you here, I said if Adam and Eve came today, mm -hmm. they will identify with Gia South. And I want to keep Why? repeating that. It <laughs> might be monotony mm. for me to keep repeating it, but it is worth informing people and having that in mind. If there is no single kilometer of tarmac since independence in my constituency, which is the second largest in the country, equivalent to three regions, tell me, is there no marginalization there? The last mile has not reached in my constituency. It has not reached, it has not touched. Water is not there. You want to tell me 35 billion shillings in Aurora Dam and any other dam, and, uh, you know, a dam in Krinyaga that's just being advertised now, 2.1 billion that has been said in the papers mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. in Krinyaga. What is not happening to Wajir South that does not get even 100,000 cubic meters water pan? That would be helping so much population. So this is, this is where it is. That is so, why I'm asking you, what do you think as a leader coming from that region, which repl replicates what is happening in other regions uh, across the northeastern region, what do you think is the missing link? Why are we not solving this problem once and for all? You see, let me say, and I'll, I'll, I'll be categorical here, and I'm, I mean, I need not to beat about the bush. You know, marginalization has been deliberately done through subsequent governments. People were talking about, uh, you know, providing service to the communities. What are the services that are being provided to the communities? You want to link 50 years of independence and say, we have already taken money to the Mashinani. You took it the other day. You've not taken it since independence. You've just started that. And you know, the fruits are being seen, but the fruits cannot be seen very well within a short period of time. You cannot make a comparison of 50 years to 10 years of devolution. devolution yeah. It is impossible. And therefore, we cannot bury our heads in the sand. We do support governments and we stand by governments, but we must say the failures of many subsequent governments that were here since independence. And that is not providing 100,000 cubic meters water pan to a place that is, look, seven, I've got seven wards. Four out of the seven wards are, you know, uh, saline. Boreholes cannot be done. The water is saline. So the only source of water could be a huge dam. A one billion dam would really, really help these places, you know? Mm -hmm. And the four wards are neighbors, you know? That's why the land uh, formation is the same. Mm -hmm. And therefore, here is where it is, you know? Uh, services are not looked across the board. It is about who is close to the pie. That is where it is. And that is where the representation comes in. So... So, so what, what, what are you advocating? You want... Um, representation to mean what? To have people from those regions represented in the national leadership or what is it that is your work? At the same equivalent as the rest. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, uh, uh, um, as they said, you know, uh, uh, some people are, you know, more equal than others. Uh, that must stop. And that must stop. And I will be very categorical here. And I don't, I don't have to mince my words on this. You know, uh, you know, uh, 
they are, everybody is important, but there are those that are more important than others. But do we and that should stop, mm -hmm. ideally. Do we need to change how we describe national leadership or do we need to have every community represented in the national leadership? Which direction do we need to go? Because I believe, like you said earlier, we cannot have everybody fully represented in the national, in the spaces that we have in the national leadership level. So do, is it a, perhaps a, a, about time for us to really redefine how let's, we look at this? Let, let's let's this not position? narrow our, let's not put our heads, you know, so narrowed to representation as only who is the president and who is the deputy president, who is the prime minister. That is not what exactly the representation is. The numbers of people. Now, a whole, you know, But we're talking about the national cake. That is where decisions yeah, about but, but, where but, but, the, the pieces the of the national cake, cake, at the national cake are made. At the, at the national cake, when you are going to have so many ministers and you only have one minister to represent an entire region, that in itself is critical and it is important that that is recognized. But that is not even the only point thing that I, I really want to put myself into. Mm -hmm. It is about uh, providing the leadership not at the narrow end. So if you are up there in the helm, you must also surround yourself among people who can really clearly represent the entire region. So if you give me a particular representative coming from a narrow end of the constituents of the of the of the of the region and that individual only focuses on that particular region uh, that particular village that he or she could be coming from that in itself is under representation yeah that's why and I at the you. leadership top level if they find that mm -hmm. that kind of you know uh, categorization is done then the big stick needs to be taken that's why i asked you maybe it's about time we redefine national leadership exactly we cannot e afford e to e have e everybody e exactly, on the table. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so redefining that is very important. All right. Mm -hmm. Talking about areas that have been marginalized, um, the northeastern region for a very long time has also suffered the perennial issue of insecurity. I want us to talk about that in a bit. If you look at what is happening right now, how do you assess the security situation in, in the northeastern region where you come from? Look, the security situation in the northern region is, is, there is a challenge and we will not hide from that. Mm -hmm. But let me take you back to what security situation that we want to talk about here. There are three categories. There's the usual banditry that causes insecurity, mayhem, and uh, you know people cannot travel on buses and all that. There's the Al-Shabaab phenomena. And then there is the pastoralists that are fighting and contesting over grazing. So those are the three categories of insecurity. Mm -hmm. And now we cannot you know, uh, say that all size fits all when it comes into handling them. So each one needs to be handled in different categories. Mm -hmm. And that is where, and that is where the national security needs to focus on. My take is that you must define insecurity. I mean, we have taken it wholesomely. Unfortunately, uh, that is wrong. We need to define it. We need to open it up. We need to use a final lens to say that the insecurity that happened today it's not Al-Shabaab, but it's banditry on the road. The insecurity that happened yesterday was because of Al-Shabaab. It is not banditry. The insecurity that happened the day before is because of grazing, you know, uh, contest for grazing fields and people who are, you know, talking about water and uh, the little Niagara water. In fact, if you would have given me 20, 35 billion shillings to provide to the northern region for water, it would have been sufficient enough not to cause any mayhem. And some of the insecurities is happening because of the division of revenues to the national, the, 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 the national cake, you know, being divided and, and used around that. So, you see, lack of water causes insecurity. Lack of rain does that. Lack of, you know, uh, uh, vegetation in particular areas because it will force my people to move from my place to go to another county and therefore skirmishes does occur. To avoid that, provide us water. Give us one billion pan. Uh, or dam, let me say it, uh, you know, in each constituency. Mm -hmm. That will reduce these skirmishes and the amount of money being spent on security would have been reduced. Mm -hmm. If we are going to talk realistically, that is. But that is not happening. So there are three categories of insecurity. And let's not beat about the bush. All insecurity in the northern region is not about, you know, Al-Shabaab only. There is banditry. There is issue to do with grazing fields, tensions among communities, and inter-clan clashes. And there is also 
the issue of definitely Al Shabaab. Mm -hmm. So this categorization must first of all happen and an open discussions on the table must come forth. All right. You've talked about the top bottom approach uh, to address the insecurity issue. As a leader also from uh, 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 the region, talk to us about some bottom top approaches within the communities th that are fighting. Are there initiatives or something that is being done from your end to provide context generated solutions from among yourselves? When the top listens to the bottom, that is when solution will be achieved. So it's still about... <laughs> let, me put it, let me put it that way. But the problem when the is top that listens they... to the bottom, and you know why I'm saying that? And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Yeah. You know, in the 80s, or not even in the 80s, in the 60s, up to in the mid-2000, you know, 2005, somewhere there, mm -hmm. those that were handling insecurity were the elders, the village elders, you know, uh, that was more consultative up to the 80s, eh? say in the, in, in the, the, from, 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 from uh, mid 60s to early 2000. It was the community that was handling that. It was the community that is being considered and communicated through. If a skirmish occurs, you know, I'm a neighbor to Somalia by 180 almost mm -hmm. kilometers. I'm a neighbor to Wajia East. I'm a neighbor to Wajia West. I'm a neighbor to, uh, you know, Cielo uh, uh, County. I'm a neighbor to Lagdera in Gariza County. I'm a neighbor to Dadab County. So you see, I am being surrounded by that. But when an issue occurs, for me, the first call I do is not to anybody else. I don't even give a call to the security personnel first. I talk to the elders and I tell them what is happening. Can you give me the actual picture? And then that is when it goes to another place. Fortunately enough, and I, I, I thank God for this, we had very limited, very little you know, skirmishes in my place, or ignorable, you know, number of skirmishes, let me put it that way. But what really needs to be understood is that are we speaking to the people in one, from one angle, or are we talking to them from all directions? How are we handling this? That is what really matters. Mm -hmm. It is not only about politicians that you need to talk about. There are issues within the politicians, and obviously that, that is something that I will not deny. Politicians must respect you know, the, the process of law and, 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 the, and the justice that is required, mm -hmm. including myself. But what is also important is societies are not categorized into one angle. They need to be spoken to you know, directly, communicated with directly, and they are allowed to have a space to handle a challenge that they have among themselves by conversation, by discussions, by using traditional methods of resolving matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So unless we go back to the table and say, hey, where have we gone wrong? Then we will continue to do that. So the top needs the bottom, and the bottom needs the top. Needs the top. And therefore, that is where the categorical point for me is. I like how you categorized, you know, the, the different forms of insecurity, yes. talking about banditry, talking about even the Al-Shabaab attacks, and, you know, calling for um, specific interventions for specific types of uh, insecurity issues so that we can find a lasting solution. Mm. But let's talk about how bad the situation is. If you look at the impact of the insecurity in the northeastern region, how has it affected, um, you know, the region in terms of development and in, in even the way of life? How bad is it? So bad, so terrible. And it has been there not just yesterday, for decades. It's been there for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you see, if we say that we are going to live in the past and continue to bury our heads uh, simply because of the past, it is very unfortunate. You know, you know go to the shift of war, the antagonism that happened at that particular time. You know, I thought that it is time to move on and not to see a particular region as a hostile region. You see, every region has a problem from every corner of this country. There is a problem. Start from the center, go to the north, west, south, and east. If you go, you will find there are challenges that are there in terms of security. Even here in Nairobi, it was, you know, we could not stay. Even when Michuki was here, the late Michuki, mm -hmm. you know, it was ungovernable. Nairobi was ungovernable, our capital city, that actually East and Central Africa sees it as the, you know, the little London that we have. There has been those challenges. So we don't, we don't need to forget 
that insecurities has been there and has happened. Today, Nairobi is a place where you can walk in the middle of the night. Why did it happen? Because serious decisions has been made. Now, that serious decision should begin from us as leaders from the region. And I will, I'll, be, I'll be, you know, open and, and frank about that. It should start from the leaders ourselves. And that is where the, the, the back stops at. But it also needs to be brought forward from the national level, the national government's level, to as well as the communities. And therefore, we need to look at this in a triangulated focus. So we need to look at the prism from all corners. Mm -hmm. And now everybody is engaged into that. But you ask me as a very, very important question. How much has it affected? The economy is in the doldrums there. People cannot travel easily. There are issues and challenges that are there that we really need to look at. And all the three forms of insecurity. And I don't think whether many people do categorize insecurities in northern region like that. So the three forms of insecurities must be addressed wholesomely. Even the Al-Shabaab can be dealt with by the local leaders and elders. And I want to warn the government, uh, to advise the government, let me put it that way, not to arm locals. A big mistake will be done. It happened in the 90s, it happened in the early 2000s, and it really came back again on our face. Therefore, arming locals will be the worst decision that has been made. And history will judge me for, you know, for, for, for this. And, and, and history will say, uh, you know, that yes, this is what some of the leaders were saying, that we should not do that. Banditry will continue. The three categories, remember again, I want to return back. Mm -hmm. So someone grazing from one part of the region will go to another part with their guns. What are they gonna do? Slaughter people. It happened in many places. It happened in Isiolo. It happened in Gariza. It happened in Wajia. So it happened in many places. You know, I'm not even talking about other parts. So these are some examples. It happened in Marsabit. So what I'm only trying to say is, you cannot say that we're going to arm locals to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. We want the government to defend them. We want also the local elders recognized in terms of diplomacy and in terms of defending mm -hmm. the society from the grassroots. Right. Because they are the ones who live in that village every morning and every night. All right. Uh, when you talk about the northeastern region, for some time now there has been phobia. Uh, from people who don't come from that region to go even work and do business there based on the fact that re there was a time there was that narrative of branding people local vis-a-vis -vis non local you remember the cases when um non-local teachers were being targeted in some of these attacks what is happening as leaders have you done anything to sort of change this belief this narrative for people to feel comfortable that they can actually live and thrive in the northeastern region even if they were not born and bred there uh there are teachers that were killed that are non-locals, that, that are locals, sorry. There are teachers who were killed that were locals. Uh, and those teachers were being killed and targeted simply because they are teaching the wrong things to children, according to Al-Shabaab. You see, I will come back to the categorization, that is why it is important. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, uh, a bandit and Al-Shabaab, a bandit will want to come and rob you that beautiful watch. They rob you and they leave you. A bandit will not look into your religious perspective, will not be looking and saying that uh, Safin wants to come and, uh, you know, uh, uh, teach uh, something that is against our God, for instance, uh, in, 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 in quotes. Uh, and therefore, uh, what happens is that there are those categories of the insecurity that will be dealing with that and that are dealing with that particularly these are men who have got no you know a soft heart even for humanity and even for their god because that is a very wrong perspective and i'll tell you what we are doing about uh, in, in in my next moment for, for the question you ask me but what i want to say is that the non-locals were particularly targeted so that development does not occur in that place. Children are not educated, people are not getting the possibilities of getting the services of any other Kenyan that should be getting. These are people who have, got, who have done the same thing in Somalia. They have killed teachers who are locals. You see, they have killed teachers who are locals in, in Wajia. 
they have killed teachers who are you know locals uh, or businessmen who are locals in 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 in, in Wajia and in Somalia as well so these are people who are have got no stand and no religion so you cannot put to that the child that comes to school will definitely want to be taught by anybody mm -hmm. simply because they want to gain that knowledge I was taught by some of the teachers that, that that came from you know other parts of the country I had a teacher who came from Western Kenya who started classes for me you know in in, in the 70s they were there and they continue to remain there so that categorization is a narrative that has been established by uh, uh, these thugs who want to see that they want to polarize and divide Kenyans but we've always said we will never be divided by you know a thug who has got a particular aim so Kenyans must feel that uh, I am equally in under threat as they are wherever they go in in that region mm -hmm. so like me if I'm traveling around do you think they will spare me they will never spare me on that so whether you are a, a local or a non-local, whether I'm a local or a non-local, whether I speak the dialects or not dialects, mm -hmm. there are people who don't even speak the dialects there that are among these groups. You know, uh, they come from any other part of the country. They come from other part outside uh, the country, and therefore, uh, we should not, you know, paint everybody in that region with the same brush. All right. It is important that it is categorized and put it differently from what a thug does. Okay. We are going to be taking another short break right here on News Check. We're coming back with much more, so stay with us. And plus, continue interacting with us on social media at KBC Channel 1 at Safin underscore Cheng on Twitter, Safina Cheng on Facebook. We are coming back to pick up this conversation on the other side of the break. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. The insecurity situation in the northeastern region is what we are discussing now. As we look at the state of the nation, we started by looking at the BBI uh, process that got the green light yesterday from IEBC and now it is set to go to the next level. That is uh, to go to the county assemblies for debate, the constitutional amendment bill of 2020. Now we are talking about the insecurity situation in the northeastern region and uh, uh, Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar, uh, you have been shedding light on how bad the situation has been uh, for the residents and even those who uh, live in those uh, the counties in the northeastern region. But before we went to the break, I had just begun probing you on what, uh, you know, as part of the leadership of the region you're doing to steer, um, you know, what are term peace building initiatives and even um, foster security in the region, engaging the locals and talking to them to just change their mindset, including even young people who increasingly are becoming uh, recruited in some of these gangs. I want to understand more about some of the proactive approaches, some, some hope for people who come from the region and even want, would, would, would desire to go work in the region. For us to know that there is something being done to, to, to change the narrative. You see, uh, I travel around the world and what I have realized is this what we call community policing. Um, community policing is a very very important thing and quite critical. Uh, even if it might someone might argue that it is there in Kenya it may not be pronounced. I'll give you a simple example. For a girl in the village and God forbid if she is raped she will not come to a police station and speak to a male police officer simply because of the obvious reasons. And therefore, if we had female police, community policing officers, almost in every village, couple of them even, and those police officers will go to weddings, 
share time with the ladies there, communicate up with them, discuss with them. The relationship between the government and the police service would have been much closer. Mm -hmm. A lot of barriers that would have been there would have been breached. That young lady that I've used as an example will definitely pick up a call and speak to Savine, who is a police officer in that police station. Because of the community policing that officer has done the relationship, they have gone for henna, they have gone for parties, they have discussed, and obviously that relation, working relation, there is a distance of obviously that will be there. But we have female police officers. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, do they leave the barracks? Do they leave the uh, stations and go and interact as police, uh, police, uh, police, police uh, officers so that communities can feel at ease? Live, live alone the, the, the wider community. If they would be interacting in schools, making school stations for community policings, that is constant, not once in a very long while. That is there on a regular basis. The relationship that would have been built the information that would have been gathered by the national service, security service, would have been huge. That would have benefited this country in terms of getting intelligence at the very, very, very local. But it, if it becomes us versus them, you know what I mean by us versus them, mm -hmm. we versus them, it becomes an issue. And therefore that rope of cutting would have been taken off. And therefore, the community policing must take precedence before issues happen. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they would have been miles ahead to even understand how people think within the society and how people can understand to resolve matters that are critical within it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is one of the levels, the basic levels that must be working, that must be taken uh, forth. And, and, and taken forward. Uh, and, 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 and I want to categorically say this, that unless bottom-up is considered in terms of, you know, uh, considering things, unless we avoid all size fits for all on matters of national interest, then we will move no mile forward. Mm -hmm. All right, well said. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There is a lot that we can explore when it comes to the insecurity situation in the northeastern region, but for now, let's just leave it at that. Um, you're also a public health expert, a medic, and I'd like to take you to the world mm, of health mm, now for mm. us to focus on some health issues that yes. we are currently facing as a country. Yes. COVID-19 is, is, is actually one of the things that has really taken a better part of the conversation in the last uh, uh, from March last year and we're still battling this particular pandemic as at yesterday the number of positive cases in Kenya uh, were reported to be at a hundred thousand one hundred and ninety three yesterday there were 141 new COVID-19 cases that were recorded by the Ministry of Health and this is coming just a day after um, you know reporting no COVID-19 deaths but six people unfortunately succumbed yesterday to the disease and currently the death toll uh, stands at 1,750. We are still reporting quite a number of recoveries, uh, 207 new cases, uh, new patients uh, recovered yesterday. Uh, and of course, it's something that has taken time, and I'd like to explore um, your expertise into this particular subject. Since we rec uh, reported the first case of COVID-19 in March uh, last year, how would you rate or describe how generally we have money the pandemic as a country plus or minus look i want to tell kenyans one thing that uh, we should not uh, we should not uh, uh, take off our guard uh, meaning that we have to be vigilant as well uh, we have to be alert but not alarmed uh, why i say that is that uh, we don't want kenyans to be alarmed that there are deaths happening every day but we want them to understand to be alert so that they know that we should not drop our guard. We should not drop our guard in terms of protecting ourselves uh, on our own individual basis. Uh, the other thing that is important is that COVID-19 is here to stay, as I've said several times. You see, as an epidemiologist myself, in infectious diseases particularly, what we look at, and I don't want to use scientific terms at this particular stage, but what we look at is the rate of infection is happening, why? You see, if I am COVID positive and you are negative, 
if I have got a barrier between you and I, then the chances for you to wake up is low. We are at social distance now, as they use the term social distance mm. for, for, for the layman's. Uh, but we are at a distance to avoid infections. Yeah. And, and we have enough space around us, so there is enough airflow around us. That puts us into a situation where we say the level of possibility of infection is lower because of that action that we have undertaken. And therefore, what we call uh, the, the, the chance for people to get that infection from that particular infected individual becomes lower. So the risk ratio here is categorized accordingly, and I don't want to use scientific terms severally. Uh, the risk ratio here is looked at from an angle to say that we are at a very small space, we are not on a mask, we are continuously in a public transport that will stay in traffic jam for a very long time. These are some things that may pick up a few individuals to think categorically. Can I walk a distance? Can I walk even one kilometer? You, okay. know, mm -hmm. you know, it gives me exercise, it gives me a good health, uh, and it also reduces my chances, and that is the risk ratio of, of infection of infection because I'm not going to stay in one hour in the traffic jam compared to half an hour that I will say I have walked long enough I can pick the matter two again from here mm -hmm. so you have achieved double you have reduced your number of presence in that and I want to return back to the point where I've said COVID-19 is here to stay like flu like any other flu you see, it's flu was introduced. Anywhere, it's not going to go anywhere. Soon. There's no time we'll, we'll it, it be will out will never of the go woods. away. It will never go away. Mm -hmm. But the rate of infections, the rate at which it is going at, will obviously dwindle in the end. Yeah. But the what I'm only will, trying will to say reducing. is, cases will remain. Whether there is one case in a whole city or a two case in a whole city, it is an infection that has come to stay with us. So that is why we should not drop our guard. And I want to thank Kenyans for the grade that they have done. But I want to go back again to the issue of what happened around the world. And you see, 100 million people were infected of the latest data, 100, yes, as by yesterday's data, about 100 million, uh, 123, I don't know, 1,000. So 100 million people were infected. Of that, 2 million died. So the rate is still, 2 million is a huge number still. Uh, you see, uh, uh, you know, case fatality rate is what we use in scientific mm -hmm. terminologies. Case fatality rates that we always look at, ideally it should be zero. But we are at 2% almost. If you compare, you know, 2 million to 100 million, so you're looking at that. So, but what, what I really want to see is that uh, a, zero, a zero infection to be continuing on. That cannot happen until our behaviors change. Mm -hmm. Changing behavior of a society takes a period of time. That is why I'm saying COVID-19 will stay here. Not because necessarily that it, it, you know, it, it, it will be there to kill all of us. But what I am saying is that naturally human behavior cannot change overnight or over a short period of time. Now over a short period that COVID was here, other diseases reduced according to information we are getting. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the, the changed behavior, be, be, change behavior, <laughs> wash hands, yeah. uh, washing the hands, you know, uh, the mm. flu that everybody used to get when you are in the matter yeah. two and they cough yeah. now is reduced by the mask. So these, obviously, those diseases reduced uh, because people started changing their behavior. If we continue to change our behavior, then the possibilities of COVID-19 uh, to be trashing us all will be reduced and, and, and reduced to, 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 to a level that is manageable. All right. Uh, you know, <clears throat> let's, let's look at some of the lessons that <clears throat> this pandemic has taught us. Uh, if you look at our healthcare, uh, health sector, what are some of the uh, vulnerabilities that are, became very evident the moment we reported our first case? What is it about our healthcare system that probably wasn't going right, that COVID has just exposed? You see, there has been an excitement on devolution, particularly when health was devolved. So we said health machinane. I've got 38 health centers. And of the 38, mm -hmm. only about two are operational. I'm talking of health two. centers. Out only of 38? Two are operational. 
yet money was invested to that, that to, is what to, I'm to coming to build the 36 the healthcare workers getting healthcare workers mm -hmm. to very rural villages has been a challenge what has been a challenge is revenue trickling down from the top to the machinane what has been a challenge is because of the process of governance and counties that were not ready as yet you see so i might be a bit radical to say until the health system is you know designed in a way that it can be absorbed by devolution should we have them at the national level mm -hmm. that conversation has not been discussed simply because money is involved simply because county governments want to hold back on to that you know uh, getting that revenue for health so that they can handle it uh, one place that i really liked to so be you're frank saying with you not, we, we were not ready to devolve health we it were not have uh, we were happened. not ready to devolve health and for me you know people would have different opinions we would have devolved all services in you know particular categories and in shifts mm -hmm. and in particular patterns we would not have devolved every or, or three quarter of the services being provided to Kenyans uh, all at one go you see we would have devolved particular parts of, of the uh, devolved units and then we would have done that in the next five or ten years until those ones were established well established and the government the county governments have taken you know got the hang of it that surely we can provide services onto that. What are, what are the specific gaps <clears throat> in, our, in our health sector that probably would, you know, put us at a very vulnerable position in dealing with the pandemic as serious as COVID-19? You see, we have got level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, and level six hospitals or health services or health, health services. Let me use it that way because a dispensary is not a hospital. So those categories to those levels up to the six levels, the level six is a national hospital like the Kenyatta, you know, like the Spine, mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, you know, we talk about uh, Moy. These are the level six hospitals that are referral hospitals up the level there. Level five is regional hospitals. And then level fours and, and county hospitals. Mm -hmm. Level four now goes to, you know, uh, sub-counties, for example. And then the dispensaries and the health centers. These units need to be furbished in several levels. If I was the decision maker, mm -hmm. I would have said level one, two, and three to be handled by the county governments because that's the primary health care service. The primary health care services that provides the basics for health care is, you know, uh, stationed in the far-flung village and the mother who wants vaccination for her baby mm -hmm. the antenatal clinics uh, you know they they uh, they uh, you know uh, the wounds being taken care of small surgeries being taken care of minor surgeries rather uh, these are the categories that would have taken off and then provision of service such as you know uh, uh, COVID-19 I would have liked to see COVID-19 taken up by the public health services mm -hmm. straight on because prevention is better than cure. But what really happened is there has been a lot of mix up. Uh, some of the mix ups that happened is that we immediately rushed and looking at equipments. Very good. Mm -hmm. That is important. That is no doubt one step forward that has been taken. But it would have gone in parallel with public health education with mm. public health and prevention say, yes, mm. measures, with strict public health process that would have taken place. Mm -hmm. So it would have gone in the same level and com concomitant. So, but what really happened is that uh, there has been a wobble, you know, up and here. Because the national government it wanted some way, the county government it wanted some way. Mm -hmm. Or the county government is handling what the national government is trying to say should not be handled that way. All right. So that is a, you know, a, a situation that is bringing a wobble in terms of our way of approach to the COVID-19. All right. Plus many things that I, 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 I 
uh, time will not allow us to discuss. All right. Uh, there, there are also issues that have been raised with regards to how this has <coughs> brought about the inequalities, <coughs> the inequalities in access to um, you know, quality health care by all Kenyans. Mm. Um, there were Kenyans who could afford to go for testing, others couldn't afford, others could afford isolation, others couldn't afford. So it depended on who you are, the who is who in the society. What do you think the government has done to just bridge the gap of inequality in access to quality health care? And is it effective? Look, uh, that is a $1 million question. Uh, the health system has been overstretched. Uh, you know, the challenge that we have has been faced by well-established countries and nations uh, that were far ahead from us in terms of technology, in terms of services, in terms of uh, even uh, money. Uh, countries that were richer than us, the UK, the USA, you know, Spain, all these countries that struggled and were unable to handle uh, the COVID-19 is definitely, we are in the same category of challenges. And, and that is there. But... Having said that, uh, that Kenya is, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that Kenya is not alone in such challenges. So it is there at a global level. But there are things that we would have done domestically that would have been different. So every Kenyan deserves to be given that particular services. If someone is, has got health insurance and can go to Aga Khan the following morning, mm -hmm. then the chances of that person surviving better than a villager from a constituency is definitely obvious simply because of accessibility uh, to health services, better and well-resourced health services. You see, it's not only about access issue. It is about, is the health system there well-resourced? Res well Does it have the capacity to be able to handle X number of patients? Mm -hmm. And can this, you know, okay, health service X can handle almost, you know, say 100,000 people. Service B cannot handle even 10, you know, patients. But how can we get, reach that gap? Simply because of two reasons. One is an investment into the health system must be uniform. The investment into the health system must be uniform. And when I'm using the term health system, there are the six categories of health systems, you know, uh, that, that WHO has defined. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go into details into that. Your viewers may not be able to understand all this. But in investment in all that at the same level is critically important. So when it comes to financing, when it comes into uh, using technologies, when it comes into using, you know, all these other things that are required, service provision, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, all this must be looked at. The next level is the level at the machinane. How effective is the service provision there? Mm -hmm. And how planning is done? And I wanted to give you an example. Eldoret. I've been to Wazingishu. I think it's one of the best places that we can say the health services have been conscious. And remember, Wazingishu uh, is, is the hub of all trackies that go to come from Mombasa to East and Central Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where they stop. And therefore, the transportation hub is there in Eldoret. Mm -hmm. And what really happens is that the service provision has been examined from those providing to the machinani, to the, to the grassroots, to the mothers and villagers in the village level, and those that are being catered that are always passing by and coming mm. through. All right. So that's, should... that's, those are some of the approaches that would be necessary to look at not from one spectrum, mm -hmm. but multiple spectrum. Mm -hmm. Now you're speaking as a professional in the sector, you know, providing, uh, you know, uh, what you feel will work and offer lasting solutions to really fix some of the challenges we experience in our healthcare system. But then we, unfortunately, are almost running out of time for this conversation. But uh, before we wrap up, I'd just like to give you a chance to also talk about, uh, you know, some of the, um, you know, many have said COVID-19, the, the, the war against COVID-19 sort of took our attention away from other uh, forms of diseases that are really um, posing a burden to Kenyans and affecting Kenyans in different ways. Probably you can comment on that a little bit before we bring this conversation to a close. Look, uh, COVID-19 has ravaged societies across the world, across the globe, and uh, it has ravaged and particularly affected the poor more uh, because they became more poorer. 
uh, their life savings have been dwindled and you know used for for their for their times that they have been told to isolate themselves uh, which life is better than you know uh, than, than earnings obviously so lives have been saved uh, through that process but they, there is a lot of hunger you know in the village people are hungry and the special programs right now should take an immediate and swift action world food program has have said that the level of hunger that has happened in many parts of the world is so unprecedented they've even looked at they've looked at even during the spanish flu the level of hunger that really happened at that particular time obviously there is a difference in population right now <clears throat> and population categorization is also another important thing with with aging population uh, at, at, at those particular times but now currently if you look at even kenya as an example you're looking at 65 percent to 70 percent are youngsters you know a younger mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. and therefore that is the time they need a lot of energy that is the time they need a lot of you know uh, food and that's the time they need to grow and their growth is at the at the, uh, at, the, at, the at the peak mm -hmm. so what is happening here is that hunger has been one of the things that really touched many societies and you could see uh, you know a very simple example our children are going out and while they were staying at home the number of pregnancies that really happened is a key example because some of them are going out to get some money you know in exchange of you know uh, being with a man mm. and therefore how much how much pregnancies that yeah, we are trying yeah. to and see and talk about and the complications that. that are coming after yeah, that true, so true. children are hungry even at home for many their parents may not be able to provide so they walk out to the streets and when the schools opened you could imagine what really happened it, it, nobody was expecting this but it is better for us to plan forward and think about things where they are happening we have narrowed ourselves in prevention of infections only All right. we have not looked at the, at the aftermath we have not opened the can of worms that we we have, we have not imagined the can of worms that will be out there once the schools open and, and that is some of the things that really mm. we want to uh, see so poverty is a, a, then a, a hunger. Speak. Yeah. A hungry man is an angry, angry man. man. <laughs> and so you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine what an angry man can do yes, to society. Yes. Thank you so much for also Pleasure. bringing that up. And we really appreciate your time, Mushimiwa, for creating time for us uh, this particular morning. Honorable Professor Mohammed Sheikh Omar, Member of Parliament, Wajir South, shedding some light on some of the issues that are shaping the news in the country. We've talked about matters, BBI, insecurity situation in the northeastern region, and of course also the ongoing war against as COVID-19, the progress we are making, the hits and the misses in this particular journey. My name is Safina Cheng Oma, and our sign language interpreter is Lensa Odingo. Thank you so much for creating time for us. We are now going to be paving way for Tamrini. Nancy Okware will be taking you through that. But from us, it's a wrap. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much.